All right, welcome along everyone. We're here again today to talk about fire safety. We're going to talk about everything from the different types of detectors that you can have to the different types of extinguishing and firefighting type equipment that you can have. We got my buddy Brian Loggle here. He is a former firefighter. He is our Mr. Safety. I'm kind of the one that maybe goes a little on the edge and he always reels me back. So it's kind of helpful to have that balance. As far as detectors, I'm, I think one of the most important things is that you actually have them, you use them, and they're always operational and they're tested annually. Regarding battery operated or house powered ones, I, I'm of the mindset that you can never have too many. Depending on the type of detector that you maybe have, is there a better place? for those types of detectors? Yeah, there's good placements uh, for detectors and bad placements. Uh, one of the most common things that we find in houses is where you have someone who has one just outside of the kitchen and they don't use it or they take <laughs> the batteries out, put it on top of the refrigerator and then a fire that doesn't help you at all. Does a carbon monoxide detector detect a gas leak? or is that a separate detector? It's a separate detector. Um, they do make combination units, which are gas and carbon monoxide, and I recommend those 100% every time because for maybe $10 more per detector, you can have both coverages, especially if your house is a propane or natural gas filled fired house. Think about the fact that if you've got a gas stove, a gas furnace, a gas water heater, any appliance that you might have that's gas, or if you have a wood burning stove or a gas log insert. Anything right? that can produce carbon monoxide needs a detector. Um, and I think that's just one of the things that a lot of, especially new homeowners, they don't think about these things. Um, a lot of people put uh, bedrooms in basements. There's no detectors and that's just a recipe for disaster. Now, the other thing to keep in mind, we are in the season of COVID and people having COVID. And, and one of the things that's happening is people are not smelling or tasting. Well, guess what? If you have gas appliances, this happened to our daughter about three weeks ago. It was horrible. They had a gas leak in her apartment and she couldn't smell it until somebody came over to visit. The other thing, if you suspect a leak on any of your gas lines, take soapy water. Go get a $1.97 bottle at Walmart, just a spray bottle, mix some soap in it, shake it up and squirt it on all your gas lines. If it bubbles up, you have a leak. And if you've got a leak, call a plumber, call a HVAC guy, whatever guy you need to get in there, get them in there. Turn um, off your gas. Turn off your gas. <laughs> turn off your gas. Don't smoke. Don't light a match to find it. People joke about that. That's a joke. Do not light a match to find a leak. Should and you call the fire department to come find it? Or should you gas call plumber? Leak. Gas leak, uh, if you have an active gas leak, you absolutely want to call the fire department um, and they'll do probably the same things you could do, but in a safer way. So we've talked about actual smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, gas detectors. Those are all things detecting a leak. What do we do if we do have a fire? If you have a fire in your home, first off, before the fire even happens, uh, you should have a plan of escape. But what are the escapes out of this room? Like, don't just think, well, I walked in the door, that's the only way I have to get out. Um, I can use the window. Um, and that's something you need to plan with kids, especially because in the middle of the night, some kids don't wake up from the detector sound. They sleep right yeah. through it. Um, so having a meeting point outside your home, yeah. that's very important. That way you can account for everybody. And the main thing you need to remember is it's not as catchy as stop, drop, and roll, but it is get out, stay out. There's nothing worth going back into your home for at all. How many fire extinguishers should we have? Do we need to have four? Do we need to have six? Do we need to have one? What types? I know there's all kinds of types. So talk to us a little bit about that. Give us a little bit of education on types and quantity and size of fire extinguishers. Well, regarding fire extinguishers, this is your most typical, most common. It's an ABC fire extinguisher. Um, that means and, it's and a schoolhouse one. Yes. So you can only use it at school. It, it extinguishes all types of This is of how fire. Brian and I that's work. Right, you know? That's right. Um, he tries to be serious and I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's not a thing. <laughs> so this one is be what you would have, it would be what you would have in your kitchen um, for basic fires and placement, quantity, like with detectors and me, I say you can never have too many of these because once this is gone, it's gone. Absolutely 100% in your kitchen and in your garage. Uh, those are two places where things can go wrong really quickly. Um, if you want to be over the top, super safe, uh, you put one in each bedroom because it might be what gets you out of the door um, by just creating a pathway 
So there's a real simple acronym that we use called PASS. It's pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. So the pull is literally, you pull this out, kind of like the pin in a grenade. You aim, obviously you aim it at the fire, but you want to aim it at the base of the fire. Yeah. So the bottom part of the fire, a lot of times you see people, I want to go top down and take all the flames that are up here, down here. But if you put out the lower part of that fire, those flames don't exist anymore. Yeah. So that's the aiming. And then you squeeze, meaning you squeeze the trigger, and then you sweep across the base of the fire. So you're back and forth. And with this, you probably have 10 to 15 seconds to get that done. If it doesn't work and you don't have another one, that's the time to get out. And the only time you would ever do this is if you think you can handle that situation. That situation is you know, not so far gone that the whole room is involved. You're not gonna do anything with this other than, you know. So these don't go them. anywhere near as far as people maybe think they do? Not at all. You will run out of this far quicker than you think. How long do you so. think that would last? If you're if you're doing the pass method, how long does that that one last? This thing probably maximum of thirty seconds. Uh, there's a little gauge on there. Yes. Tell us about that gauge. So you want that gauge to be in the green. These are one-time fire extinguishers that cannot be recharged, and you want to check these, make sure that that stays in the green because that allows that uh, propellant to to get the medium out of there. We wanted to actually let you see what a fire extinguisher will do. We just emptied this fire extinguisher and it's back going again. Don't overestimate what a fire extinguisher will do. They are very limited, especially when you get a kitchen size one. What's our number one cause of fire? Most likely is uh, gonna be your unattended cooking fires. A lot of our calls when I was a firefighter were food on the stove, Sometimes it's out on arrival, sometimes it's a fully involved structure. The number two cause would be portable heaters and um, just the misuse or just aged heaters where they've got either a frayed cord or they're an old enough unit that it doesn't have a tip over feature. Another source of fires would be electrical fires, smoking. Smoking, you're actually lighting something on fire and putting it to your mouth. If you set that down, um, walk away, it could fall over, fall out of the ashtray, uh, or you fall asleep in bed, that is probably the most common, is uh, smoking in bed. Never recommended because people are unwinding for the evening, they got their cigarette, cigar, whatever they're smoking, and they drift off to sleep. Next thing they know, they wake up, the bed or bedroom is on fire, or unfortunately, sometimes they don't wake up. So another thing to think about with smoking, and we've responded to several of these fires, is somebody's smoking, they're walking into the house and they pitch it off into the flower bed. We have had multiple fires where it's caught that and lit the house on fire from there. So just be careful when you're smoking, whether you're in the house, outside the house, where you're putting that thing. Candles are something that are great. They smell wonderful and kind of create that nice atmosphere in your home. I know my house is that way. Uh, it terrifies me in that we have so many candles and we just like a cooking fire it's an unattended thing you know you i'm just gonna run to the back room for a second and you know candles laying there uh, have a, a friend who lost his home because he had one in the bathroom on the back of the toilet and that wick migrated to the edge of the candle cracked the glass and then the v pattern began in that bathroom and it just went up the wall yeah. and the whole house went to the ground we want to educate you and help you to be as prepared as you can be if the worst case scenario happens. And so a couple things that come to mind, we work with the insurance companies and, and homeowners all the time, know what your policy limit is. We're living in times when houses are rising, the value of houses are rising rapidly, but with that is the cost to repair them obviously. The, all the materials, all the labor, everything is at, a, is at a very high rate right now. So check your policy. Know what your policy is. If you were formerly insured for about 300000 you might want to bump your policy up to four hundred or four hundred twenty-five. Or if you were at a hundred thousand, you may want to be up to one hundred twenty-five or one hundred eighty thousand. I don't know. Check your area and check and see what your house is worth, and then go and make sure your policy is covering you for that, because yeah, you want to pay a lower rate, but is it really worth it if you have a emergency, if you have a devastating fire? 
it's not let me tell you it's not we just got done doing one for a, for a gentleman that's retired and his policy didn't cover anywhere near enough to rebuild his place and it's hard it's hard to deal with that and we can't do anything to help him because he just doesn't have enough money to do it you have a cell phone walk through your house with a video on and just do a slow pan around your house go through your kitchen go through your your closets go through all the open up doors and just do a video recording of what is in your home schedule any high dollar items um, whether it be jewelry whether it be some certain piece of furniture whether it be guns i know guys aren't going to want to label all their guns but you need to have some sort of inventory of it and and make sure you're going to be covered another thing to to think about is having a fire safe whether it's for some pictures, birth certificates, titles, um, whatever it may be, have a safe. They're not that expensive. Even if something did happen, you know, you're gonna be a whole lot better off. So put your important stuff in there. Um, and, and again, just think, unfortunately, you have to think worst case scenario and you're gonna be much better off because of it. If you've got topics that you'd like us to cover, send us an email. If you've got questions that you want answered, send us an email. If we've provided value to you, we ask that you'd like and subscribe. Yep. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank you, Garrett. See you soon. See you.